Good afternoon, everybody. This is Madra Clay uh, with BCED. I'm in the room with <laughs> Stacy Hawthorne, David Weathington, Brendan Allman, Nadine Iverson, and Sarah Smith. So the webinar is going to last approximately one hour. We have all the phones muted uh, at this time. Uh, we will not open the, the line for questions. If you have questions during the webinar, during the presentation, you can use the chat box and ask questions and we'll be answering those questions throughout. Uh, additionally, we'll stop periodically and answer any questions you may have. Uh, the webinar um, and, and the PowerPoint will be posted on the Pennsylvania COC uh, website as well as BCD's website in our, in our library and on the Workplace by Facebook on the ESG group. So you should have access to uh, the PowerPoint uh, for future reference. So today we're going to provide you with an overview of the application process, uh, including uh, a new electronic signature submission process. Uh, we're going to review any of the uh, changes in the application as well as allowable activities for the uh, 2019 funding. Uh, we put most of the changes in the beginning of the webinar. We know we have a lot of veterans who uh, participate year to year. And once we get through all of those changes, if, um, there's, everything else is pretty much the same and you can drop off if you want or you can stay uh, in case you have additional questions. Um, we'll give you an opportunity to, um, to ask uh, application specific questions. Um, if you have uh, programmatic questions that don't pertain to, to the application uh, or anything related to the funding for fiscal year 2019, uh, you can email Stacey Hawthorne at S-H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E at PA.gov. So we opened up the, the guidelines and application on April 1st. And your review period is, is until May 31st of 2019. Uh, you're, there's a two-week submission time frame, so you can submit your application anytime from May 31st at 8 a.m. through June 14th, 2019 at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll accept uh, the uh, single application uh, during that time. Um, all attachments must be uploaded in the system by the due date. And you also, in, in terms of the things that you must submit to us, uh, the, the resolution um, must be postmarked uh, on the same date, the last date that the application is due. We will not accept any hard copies of the application other than what uh, we've asked you for. So please make sure you read through the uh, guidelines and make sure you're submitting the appropriate information. Eligible applicants are any unit of local government, including cities, boroughs, townships, towns, counties, home rule, municipalities, and communities that desire to apply on behalf of other municipalities. Local governments must apply on behalf of nonprofit organizations, which will perform services as a subrecipient. However, we now allow nonprofits to apply as well as eligible applicants um, and uh, if, if you're a nonprofit wishing to apply, you must apply as a regional project, which means there are multiple counties involved in that process. And if you're applying for shelter operations, uh, you must have uh, permission from that local governing body to do so. When submitting your application, you want to go to the website link that's here on the PowerPoint and just for people who may be listening in on the phone, that link is https uh, colon slash slash www.esa.dceb.state.pa.us. Log in or register as a new user. Uh, then be sure to put ESG 2019 on the application as the funding source. Um, if you're a new user, on the left side of the page, uh, I would recommend that you go to the application walkthrough and, um, and then ESA and, and submission questions can be directed to our customer service um, at 
And again, any ESC questions can be directed to Stacey Hawthorne at uh, shawthorne at pa.gov, mm -hmm. or uh, she put her phone number there for everyone, 717-214-5332. Mm -hmm. So when you go in to submit your application, you'll see a general application. It, it looks like this. You want to make sure at the top of it uh, where it says um, uh, assistance that you're applying for and this is not a very good copy of it so just you know this is just a just to give you an, an, an example of what it would look like make sure you check box all the appropriate services that you're, you're applying for uh, fill out this entire uh, description form The next slide is a resolution for the municipality. You want to make sure all of this is filled out as well. I point you to the bottom of the page where you would uh, get a signature, and that is the chief elected official uh, of the uh, municipality that is applying, not the, the executive director or the nonprofit organization that, that may be uh, preparing the application on behalf of the county. So you want to make sure you get the signature of the chief elected official. We put a secondary resolution in for nonprofit organizations applying as a regional project. Again, you want to fill out all components of this application uh, of the resolution. Um, and again, at the bottom, you'll see the, the signature line is for the board president of the organization and not the executive director or a, a, the nonprofit or some other entity that may be preparing the application on your behalf. This is another, the statement of assurances is another form that you would have to mail in to us. You want to fill out, this is just the signature page of it, you want to fill out all components and then ensure that you uh, as, a, as a local municipality, get your chief elected official, and as a nonprofit organization, you have your board president sign this document. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nadine to talk about the uh, new signature process for submitting your application. Thank you, Madra. Hi, everybody. Uh, so on April 1st of this year, DCG went to a new process with signing your grants. Those who have received grant contracts in the past know that you usually got a blue back contract mailed to you, and then you needed to have two elected officials sign it and send it back to us to get the process started. However, there won't be any paper sent to you anymore. It's now going to be sent to you electronically through um, certain domains and through the email process. Sarah will go over some slides with you here in just a few moments on the details of that process, but a couple of things I just wanted to highlight before she got into that. And that is that each person that signs the contract must have their own unique registration ID as well as um, their e own unique email address in order for this to be successful. Um, it cannot be a shared email address, so it can't be like an info at whatevercounty.org or anything like that. And it can't be a shared email address with one person for two people. It has to be each individual unique uh, email addresses. When it is sent to you, it's going to come into, you, into an email into your inbox, which we will gather certain information ahead of time from your contact person as to who those people should be. So it will be very important that you keep up on checking your emails regularly um, so that this process can be smooth without any bumps in the road. And I'll circle back here toward the end, but I'm going to let Sarah start in on how this new signature process will look and work, and you may hear me in a second time to time. time. <laughs> Thanks, Nadine. Okay, so um, what we're going to take a look at here um, is kind of a condensed version of if you're new to the process, if you do not already have your own individual unique username and password to access the electronic single application for assistance, which is where you typically go to to submit your application. Um, so again, as Nadine mentioned, it is very important that any person that might potentially be required to e-sign a contract document has their own username and password unique to their own email address. 
info at yourcounty.com would not be acceptable in that case. JDO at yourcounty.com potentially would be um, because it is an individual email address. So if you have already been and you know how to get to the electronic single application, uh, you can go there to register your account. And if you have not, step one under the picture just shows you essentially dceb.pa.gov forward slash single app. That's just a quick way to get there. ESA.dcd.state.pa.us. Yeah, you get, the, you get the gist. Like, that's very long. This is a little more simplified. Either one will get you to the electronic single application. And if you do not already have your username and password, you will click register on that screen. The next screen will take you to um, your name, address, email, um, security question, essentially filling out your account information. Every red diamond is a required field, so you'll need to fill out all of those required fields and click on submit. Once you click on submit, because we are taking you through the electronic single application, you'll come to where it says begin a new application. At this point, you don't need to do anything else inside of the electronic single application, and you may log out. If you're filing a new application, however, you would want to stay logged in um, so that you can file that application. Once um, an email is sent to you, it will come from eSignature at bceb.gov. That is happening across the board for multiple agencies. It does tend to look like spam in your inbox, so oftentimes a spam filter will catch it, but it really truly is not. So make sure that you put eSignature at bceb.gov into your safe list for your emails. Uh, once you do get that email that comes in, it will have some information like the um, signature request and it'll say specifically what it is and it'll give you an expiration date. You should see your name, um, your first and last, your title and your email address just to confirm that it is going to the right person. Uh, when you do that, then you'll click on the link to access the e-signature portal that we have circled there. Uh, once you Click on the link to access the e-signature portal. You will know you're there because it says electronic signature portal on the screen. You will want to log in at the top right-hand corner of that screen. Um, and then you will put in your username and password. So if you already have your username and password and it is an individual account and not a shared account, this is where you would enter your username and password. If you just registered, you went through those first steps that we talked about, and you just registered, same deal. You will enter your username and password that you just registered here, and then you'll go ahead and click on login. Once you click on login, you'll be able to see the electronic signature request that was sent to you. You'll be able to look at the documents that are sent to you for approval. They will all be coming in a PDF format. You may save that format. Uh, you may save the PDF. You can also save it and print it um, so that you know what you're actually signing. On the left-hand side, you'll again want to verify that your information is accurate, your name, your title, your email address. At the bottom, there is a legal disclaimer highlighted with a red box. You will need to check that you understand that once you sign this document, it is the same as putting ink to paper. And then you will see you have three selections to sign. It is sign, sign with comments, or deny. If you sign, the, uh, the, the signatory information will then be accepted. You will advance to the confirmation screen, which you see on the screen in front of you. If you sign with comments, those com you'll still see the confirmation screen, but the comments will then be sent back to the program office. And if you deny, you, your uh, application obviously will not be signed. It will be returned as a denial um, request to the agency, and then the program office will be in touch with you. Uh, but once you check that legal box and select sign, you don't have to type anything in the comments uh, unless you're instructed to or unless you really feel it's necessary. Um, but once you click sign and you see that automatic um, documents, your, your signature has been uh, approved, that approval screen gives you the uh, go ahead that it is now safely back with the program office as being signed. And I, I just want to interject something. If you could go back one slide, um, you'll see in the email that you receive at the end there, the first line it says expiration date. So when we, uh, when we send this to you, a certain number of days will be assigned to the email that you have to sign this particular grant. If it expires, we have to start the whole process over. So be, please be cognizant of that. 
In addition to that, both signatories will, will be getting the email at the same time in most cases. So it's only valid if both of you sign it in, in a timely manner. So please be aware of that as well. You won't be aware if the first person has signed or not. It'll be coming to each of you separately unless you discuss it outside, you know, outside of, the, of the realm of looking at your email. Um, and uh, if for some reason you see that link that's circled there that has the big red arrow pointing to it, as Sarah mentioned, that will take you right to the database where you can see your documents and do the, do the signing. If for some reason you delete your email or something like that, or the link is broken for any reason, that e the address that's in that box right next to the big red arrow, if you just type that into your browser, you should be able to get to the same place by doing that. Mm -hmm. So just know there's another option that you can access the portal, if you will. Yep. And you'll still be required to enter your username and password yeah. that you created or that you've already had to access electronic signal application. So as long as you can access ESA, you can essentially log into the portal, the partner portal for e-signature and get that taken care of. Um, I'm with the customer service team, so of course if you call in and ask for Sarah, there's only one Sarah in customer service. If you have specific questions pertaining to something that I went over today or that Nadine went over, I can get you in touch with her as well. So feel free to ask those questions now if there are any. Ask them in your chat box, and if there are not, we will excuse ourselves, but you may feel free to ask those questions um, further down the road if something were to come up. Yes, and one further thing as well is my team of staff people will probably be the ones that you'll be hearing from as far as in emails, asking for additional information such as um, the chief elected official or the, other, the second official's name, title, and email address. Uh, so don't be fearful that since it's not coming from Madra, Stacey, or one of those program people, um, that it's not valid. It will be. Yeah, I think we have a few questions. Okay. Meeting. Because the e-signature is for contract documents, right? Yes, correct. Anything that would be requiring a legal signature that you used to put pen to is now going to be electronic on the contract document. Correct. And, and it's just for grant documents. I don't know if anyone does tax credits or anything with us, but it's only for grant documents. Does this mean that the chief elected officials will need to be registered in order to sign electronically? Yes. Yes, so a lot of times um, I, it's my understanding that there will be one login for anyone in your local government entity or, or other entity that you can use to log on to ESA, but each individual person will need their own now. In order to sign. In order to in order to sign, yes. Budget amendments. Can budget amendments be done electronically, signed as the contract process? Yes. It, this will not just be for brand new contracts. This will also be for amendments to the contract that you will be electronically signing as well. And we have some other uh, forms of internal processes with grant the grant contracts that we'll be using it for as well. Is the e-signature process needed for the application as well as the contract process? The, if, you correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but the application process, the, um, the fact that you acknowledge it at the end is your e-signature. You don't have, it's not. That's not the official e-signature. So correct. when you actually click on submit that you verify that all the information in your um, application is correct, that initial signature for um, submitting the application, that's essentially saying, yes, I'm Sarah, I entered all the information for my organization, yes, you can contact me if you need anything else. I'm going to put my name to that and click on submit application, but that's not the official uh, registered electronic signature like your ink would be. Yes, if the chief elected official wants to register now, there's no reason why they can't go in there now and get it registered and be done in ahead of time. Absolutely. I would just make sure that they write it down somewhere or that they keep good records of what their username and password is. And when we reach out to the contact person for the elected officials' uh, names, titles, and email addresses, when you get back, when they get back to us, it would be really helpful to know that they've already done that. Mm -hmm. uh, because if they, if they have, we don't have to clog their emails with, this is how you go to register, because that would be the next step that we would do. Well, one important thing to note too, if, if somebody already has an individual email registered because you put in, you're putting in grants or making loan requests or tax credit, whatever, um, 
you have to be careful. You don't need to re-register. You don't need to register it again. If you already have an individual account registered that you access ESA, electronic single app, for more than one thing, you do not need to register a second. That one will suffice as long as you give that email address to your program office for the documents to be emailed to. Any other questions from those on the line? Uh, we have an internal question here. If a CEO assigns a designee to sign the app uh, to sign the contract grant contract or application, the application that should still be okay. It's the, it's the grant okay. contract that must have the CEO and another official sign. Okay. Three commissioners. Three commissioners sign our contracts. May I register three of them and have them log in individually? Yes, as long as they're individually registered, that's fine. What if we had a change in staff? New staff should create or mo uh, if we, uh, the question is if we had a change in staff, should the new staff create a new login or modify the former staff? It's based on their email, so it's going to have to be new login. Mm -hmm. That's what actually handle that really. Yeah. But new logins would then disconnect you from anything that was previously submitted. Like you wouldn't be able to see anything that the other login previously submitted. Just for this specific it, application. Mm -hmm, just for this specific application, yes. Yeah, if your application is all the way through and it's almost over and then some staffing changes, chances are you won't have to do it at that particular time. Mm -hmm. But by the time the newest amendment would happen to be created or a new application would be submitted, then you would have to make sure that everybody is registered right away. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And as Sarah said, uh, she and I are here to help you if you have any questions on this particular um, process. Once we get off the, the line here, just send your questions to to Stacy and she can forward them to us and we can certainly get back to you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you. Me. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of our allocation for ESG for fiscal year nineteen we're anticipating $5,500,000, uh, maybe a little more based on um, the slight increase that we received in homelessness, um, but that's what we're, we're going to base things on until we get official notification. Uh, the amount available for grants would be the $5,500,000 uh, minus any, uh, that 7.5% that BCB takes for administrative uh, costs that we then share uh, with the grantees. Uh, we also reduce uh, that allocation for the amount of funds that we put into our, our HMIS. Uh, so then the balance of those funds will be available for allocating to um, project activities. Uh, we plan to have 40% or more of the total available uh, amount allocated to uh, rapid rehousing, and we will not put in more than 20% uh, for emergency shelter activities. We will maintain the uh, method of distribution uh, that we have done in the past where 40% of our funds would be allocated to projects in the Eastern CLC. 40% uh, of the funds will be allocated to projects in the Western CLC. And 20% of the funds will be allocated to entitlement entities and other non-balanced estate applicants uh, that are also not an entitlement community. So updates for this application is we increase the, uh, the minimum grant amount that an agency or a regional project can request, um, increased from 25,000 to 35,000 for a single activity or a combination of services. So no grant request will, will uh, be accepted less than $35,000. The expenditure deadlines that we've worked under previously 
uh, was that the agencies had to meet a 50% requirement by the mid-year, previously one month or one one year time frame, and and then the nine month time frame uh, when we changed it to an 18 month contract. Uh, now we're going to require that you you'll still be required if you're granted an award, you'll still be required to uh, invoice quarterly at a minimum. You're allowed to invoice uh, as frequently as your agency may need to do so. However, uh, you have to have at least 25% uh, of your funds uh, expended within the first five months of the date of the award letter and uh, up to 75% expended by, the, by month 13 and then 100% of the grant must be expended within 18 months, which is the end of the contract. And we put that in to uh, help agencies meet the expenditure requirements uh, in lieu of uh, contracts taking uh, longer than usual to, uh, to finalize. Um, we also have um, a match waiver. Grantees are expected to match 100% of their grant award unless provided a match waiver. In order to uh, be considered for a match waiver, an applicant must request uh, on, on the intent to apply form, request that, that they are in need of um, a waiver of the match. Um, we only have uh, $100,000 that is available to uh, waive uh, for applicants, but you also must have either an operating budget of less than 100,000, serve, serve an area that is predominantly low or moderate income persons, which is uh, more than 60% uh, LMI, or, uh, and this is the important, more, more important one, that you lack the resources to meet the match requirement, which would prohibit your agency from applying for funding. So we don't want agencies to not apply if they cannot meet the match requirement, but just understand that the match would be competitive and there may be multiple agencies uh, applying for that, that match waiver. And uh, if you indicate in your application uh, your request is greater than what we have allowable and there are others that are in consideration as well, um, you, you may not be able to get funded if you can't meet the match requirement. But applying for the match uh, waiver does not guarantee that you will receive the waiver or that your, your uh, application will be funded. Shelter renovations, uh, we have not prioritized uh, shelter renovations over the past few years. Um, they will not receive preference to the primary and secondary priorities that will be outlined uh, later on and are outlined in the application. If we do fund shelter, it will be for those uh, more serious uh, cold deficiencies uh, to help improve the shelter and not necessarily just for uh, agencies wanting to repaint walls or change the carpet, things of that nature. Um, if you're awarded shelter renovations, you must have your contracts uh, with firms um, signed uh, and materials purchased within the first six months and submitted to BCD, and your work should be completed within the first nine months of the contract. Regional projects, if, if applicants are applying for a regional project, you have to address the regional need and not necessarily individual counties that are applying within. So look at it as a holistic project and regionally, you're going to provide, you know, various services and be able to work within those different communities uh, to, to help people who are homeless or near homeless and that your request must be supported by data. Um, regional projects demonstrate coordination of, of activities in all locations uh, where funding is used and we, give them priority consideration uh, for funding, although it does not guarantee that you will get funded just because you came in as a regional project. The application has to meet all of the criteria uh, to, in order to be funded. 
Um, so why do a regional? Uh, it provides you an opportunity to move funding to different entities if uh, you have a, a, a low performer or a non-performer. If you have an agency not spending money, you have the opportunity to move those funds around and ensure that you, you have a more comprehensive program and better coordination of services. You may not be able to move the funding from, let's say, um, from rapid rehousing to emergency shelter, but you may be able to move the funds from one rapid rehousing provider to another who is able to, uh, who has the capacity to provide the services and will expend the, the funding appropriately. Housing and or redevelopment authorities may not the administrators of the ESG funds unless a competitive bidding process has been completed and documentation of the process is included in the files. The applicant should indicate if another agency is administering the grant when they submit their application. If this process has already been completed, which is the competitive bidding process, then submit a copy of the agreement uh, within, the, within the application. We highlighted this minimum restriction again, just to reiterate that that 35,000 is important and that grants uh, agencies cannot request anything less than $35,000. But even with that minimum request, you have to demonstrate need. <clears throat> Emergency shelter operation funding requests may not exceed 25% of the total shelter operating costs for the grant period. When you submit your when you submit your your uh, your budget, and you submit your documentation in the application. If you do not show us what your total shelter operating costs are for the grant period, we will not be able to consider you for funding, even of the 25 percent. So you have to show us that the amount that you're requesting does not exceed 25 percent of your operating costs for your shelter. Applicants who do not provide direct services must enter into a grant agreement with a third-party subrecipient. And grantees that use third-party subrecipients are still responsible for all contractual obligations, including oversight and monitoring. The ESG direct entitlement communities, which are Appendix A of the program guidelines, may only apply for rapid rehousing and administration funds. We would consider uh, HMIS funding, uh, but there would be some restrictions and requirements that I'm not sure uh, the, these entitlement communities or uh, the, actually what we missed putting up there, non-entitlement communities as well, would be uh, amenable to. So um, if that is a request, then we, we should have a conversation about it. But direct entitlement and non-entitlement communities applying on behalf of subrecipients must identify in their narrative whether the subrecipient is receiving any amount of the direct entitlement ESG funding for the same activities uh, they are requesting from, from DCED. Administrative fund requests may not exceed 3.75% of the total amount of funds requested. If you're awarded, your, the administrative funds will be reduced to 3.75% uh, of whatever amount the agency was awarded in the contract. Contracts will not exceed eight, an 18-month period from the date of the award, and that is the date that we put on the award letter. Uh, no assistance can be obligated to uh, help any of your participants beyond the 18-month contract period with the Commonwealth. And grant funds may only be used for eligible activities outlined in the ESG regulations. I'm going to pause here for a moment to see if anyone has questions. If applying as a nonprofit for regional projects, does a public hearing need to be held in each county that is being covered? How does applying as a nonprofit differ from going through the county? 
Yes, if if you're applying as a nonprofit, you would have to have a hearing in each of the counties that is going to be part of that regional application. How does it, how does okay? So how does uh, applying as a nonprofit differ from going through the county? Well, the as a, as a nonprofit. It's, there really is no difference except the oversight from from the county level. Um, you would have one entity that would take the lead that would serve the same role that the that the uh, that the local municipality would serve, uh, but that entity could be a nonprofit. So you would still have the same requirements as a county. Uh, the Applying as a nonprofit for a regional allows you the opportunity to coordinate better with the surrounding counties to be able to provide uh, more and perhaps better services uh, in each of the areas that's going to be part of the application. The other part to that is that in terms of the funding, uh, you can move those move those funds around to different providers. Um, a little easier than uh, you would be with the county, and you you would uh, going in under the county would would limit you to just providing services within that county. Can you please repeat what you said about HMIS funding requests? Um, we are, are are not currently we don't have any application to fund HMIS for. Uh, Entitlement communities and um, non-balanced estate entities that would apply. Um, if one of those entities are interested in receiving HMIS funding, um, there's a, a separate process that we would go through, and we would uh, require you to uh, report your data directly into our HMIS. So I didn't I didn't necessarily say all of that, but there's that's part of it. Uh, we can pay for costs for rapid rehousing across contracts. We just can't obligate since we don't know if we will get funding in the next round. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that. I, I'm, I'm going to need a little bit of clarification on that question. Can you slide that up a little bit? Okay. Can you can you send her a private message, please? Um, will you please go back to the slide regarding housing authorities and redevelopment authorities not being able to administer the grant? Okay. We're trying to catch up here with you also. So basically, the housing redevelopment authorities cannot be administrators unless there was a competitive bidding process completed and documentation of the process is included in the files. Yeah, you can't obligate funding further than 18 months. That, that just means that you cannot, you cannot assign, uh, as you're doing your planning for the year, um, you can't go beyond that 18 month planning process with the ESG funds that you're awarded because you only have it for 18 months. Now, if you know that you're, you know, I mean, we, we have had um, uh, contracts that are running simultaneously, you can use, as long as you stay within the, the uh, time frame that you're allowed to provide services for individual clients, that they're not getting more than 24 months worth of assistance within three years. Uh, if you have two grants that are running simultaneously, then you can uh, assign funds to assist the person um, with that subsequent grant. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. You said 25% is the maximum for shelter activities, but on page 12 of the guidelines, the state the limit is 20%. Oh, okay, so 
So, yeah, those are two different things. So the 20% is that out of the DCED allocation, we're not going to assign more than 20% of our allocated funds to shelter activities. However, when the, when the, when the applicants apply, um, they cannot request more than 25% of their total shelter operating budget for the time period that they're requesting a grant. Which one am I? Okay. Solicitation of participants. Can you talk about what will qualify as reimbursable expenses? If 211 is our coordinated entry point, can we use ESG dollars to get the word out about these services for all of our partner agencies? You can use ESG funds, you can use your ESG admin funds to uh, get the word out about services uh, that are provided by all agencies. So, yes, coordinated, you can, coordinated entry is that entry point and where you're going to pull your client list, but you also want to, your, you want the community as well as the people that you're, that you're going to serve and other providers to know that uh, you have these services available. So you could use admin funds for that. Does a resolution have to be completed by each county that is participating is going through as a nonprofit? Good question. Can I get back to you on that one? Yeah, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, how can we be listed under a city grant? Who do who do we contact? Okay. So whatever. So the question is, who who, who to contact to be a sub grantee, sub recipient? Uh, whatever city or county that you're located in. Uh, you want to contact uh, any municipality, it could be a borough, it could be a county, township, any municipality that would be willing to apply on your behalf uh, can come into DCD and apply for funds. Most often we get uh, requests from counties and cities. Uh, uh, it's rare that we get any from boroughs or townships or home rule municipalities, but your, uh, any of them may apply. But I would say as a, as a first start, you want to go to your, uh, to your county um, office that provide homeless services and, and uh, let them know that you're interested in applying to DCED and you want them to apply on your behalf. If you have a regional applicant, does this, does this take the oversight responsibilities from the county? The applicant becomes the grantee, not the county. So it depends on, you know, we, haven't, we haven't addressed uh, regional county projects, um, but you can have a regional county project, but as the way, the way that we have it set up with the regionals for nonprofits, it does take the oversight responsibilities from the county and goes to the nonprofit who's serving as that entity that, that would have that oversight responsibility as the county would if they were the applicant. Regarding no assistance can be obligated beyond the term of the contract. If a client is still in need of assistance at that time, the PADCD ESG funding ends, can the client be assisted with other funds or do you expect the client to be exited from receiving all assistance? You, you, you are able to provide a client with assistance from any pot of funds that is available at your disposal to, uh, to, to serve that client. Um, once our assistance ends, there's nothing more that we can do unless you receive a, another contract. Uh, but uh, if you're using ESG funds, uh, you, can, you can use them right up until the end if the, if, if the client still needs services after, I mean, because our contract is 18 months, um, if it is, uh, you know, a rapidly housing client, you want to make sure you do that recertification at the 12 month period to make sure they still need services. But if they do, you can continue to assist them um, during, uh, until, until the end of the contract period. 
but I would recommend that you then, you know, that during the time that you have our contract, you seek other funds to be able to assist and 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 um, and have you know sort of a backup plan, have funds that you can uh, use outside of any funds that you were awarded by DCD. In the past, the ESC application certification e-signature from ESA had to be printed out and signed by the applicant and mailed to DCD after the electronic application was submitted. Will this change in any way due to the new e-sign e process for contracts? You no longer have to submit the, the, uh, the ESC application certification. We're only requesting that you submit the resolution and the statement of assurances. Where can we find the list of 2018 ESG awards? Uh, contact Stacy, and she can uh, provide you with a, actually, it's, it's, on, the, it's on our our website. If you go to www.pennsylvaniacoc.org, there's a tab that says ESG, and all of the awardees are listed there. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to move on since there are no other questions in the box. So the priorities for our funding are rapid rehousing is our primary uh, priority. Uh, secondary to that is street outreach, homelessness prevention, and emergency uh, shelter essential services. Um, Non-priority would be emergency shelter operations. Uh, and there again, your, your funding request is limited to 25% of the total shelter operating budget for the 18-month period of the contract. So um, under that secondary priority, uh, that should say emergency shelter essential services. DCB will use this funding resource to support HUD's core mission which is to ensure the most vulnerable populations receive the best outcomes and the highest standards of service. Grantees are expected to end homelessness for participants quickly and efficiently. Participate in the local COC and follow their guidance for acceptable participation. Use the local coordinated entry process and use a housing first approach to providing services. Applicants are expected to address the federal priorities in Home Together, which is the federal plan to prevent and end homelessness, which addresses veteran homelessness, chronic homelessness, um, families, youth, and children, and all types of homelessness, uh, individual homelessness. Um, housing First uh, is an approach to provide permanent housing immediately and with few to no preconditions, behavioral contingencies, or barriers. You must use the housing first approach uh, if you're funded with ESG. For street outreach, you, you have to, unless you're a new applicant, meaning you have never come to us for uh, funding, um, you have to show us how you've participated in the 2019 point in time count. You have to show us you participated and that you've identified homeless individuals and families that were not housed or sheltered. Um, it's a requirement, uh, and it was in last year's application, that anyone funded must participate um, during the, the point in time. Uh, eligible activities um, under street outreach is engagement, case management, emergency health and mental health services, transportation, services to special populations. Um, so these are eligible activities here, um, but if you go into the regs, it gives you a little more detail, and I'm just going to address one in particular, uh, transportation. It says, transport, it says travel by outreach workers, social workers, medical professionals, or other service providers during the provision of eligible street outreach services. So you can provide transportation to, uh, for a client to a service, but once you provide that transportation, your, your, uh, the cost of billing to ESG is, is done. So whatever you transport to, and, the, and that's the end of, of the 
uh, service that you're providing to the person. Okay, housing locator services are activities necessary to assist housing to assist program participants in locating, obtaining, and retaining suitable permanent housing and increasing housing stability and self-sufficiency. If applying for rapid rehousing is specifically uh, a housing locator support, make sure you highlight in your application uh, the housing locator activity. So make sure that that particular component stands out in your application that this is something you're designating some of the funding to uh, under the rapid rehousing uh, activity that you are specifically looking to address uh, and, and have um, a housing locator working on behalf of the client. The housing locator services, uh, I will not read the slide to you, but those are the allowable activities that you can do. Um, when you're, uh, and, and there's more guidance out there on, on this, so if, if anyone needs additional guidance, we can, we can provide it, but these are housing locator services activities. I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you, Madam. So I'm going to start with the conditions for funding. Um, the first, first condition for funding uh, is the limited English proficiency, otherwise known as LEP. Uh, this is, falls under uh, Section 601 of the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, LEP Statutory Authority, Executive Order 13166. Uh, also, grantees are required to make reasonable efforts to provide language assistance and meaningful assistance for, LAP, for people uh, LEP persons, uh, as well as a four-factor analysis. This analysis uh, goes from the methodology, frequency of the program activity, contact, the nature and importance of the program, activity or service provided by the program or activity, and the resources available and cost to the, to the recipients. Uh, also uh, included in the LEP is the language access plan, which must be signed by your chief elected official. Uh, next condition is uh, the statement of need. So within the statement of need, you want to be able, you want to make sure you're providing um, needs, a needs-based and data-informed narrative with a detailed explanation of, the, of homelessness in your community, uh, a description of how the agencies will provide a comprehensive range of services, including partnerships with mainstream resources and gaps in services. To point out none. Balance of state applicants must include a copy of their HUD system performance measures uh, with the with the application, and of course, that's going to be your 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 most recent recently submitted HUD system performance measures. And then all program design forms must indicate how the agencies must uh, how the agencies will meet the needs of the community as outlined in the need statement. And we'll go into the program design forms a little bit later. Continuing on with the conditions is grantees will submit homeless da data into an HMIS or a comparable or comparable database uh, for victim DV providers or other victim service provider uh, entities. Housing First must be must use uh, Housing First. You must use this approach when providing all services that you're applying for. Uh, solicitation of participants. Uh, community notification of services with the priority populations that you identify in your application, and then residency requirements. Applicants must not place a residency requirement on participants in order to receive services. Continuing with the conditions of funding is the program design forms. So you must submit one for each subrecipient that will be providing services, as well as the point in time. Uh, all ESG funded recipients are required to participate in the annual point in time count and provide a timeline of activities to be completed. So when I talk about the point in time count, it's the point in time count for your designated CSV. And then reports. BCED requires submission of a closeout report, a success story at the end of every contract. Continuing on. Rent reasonableness and fair market rent. 
if providing rental assistance, um, if providing rental assistance, you must develop and implement standards to ensure compliance. All federal requirements must be met in the regulations 24 CFR 576 as outlined in the application and as followed uh, fair housing, equal access, prohibition against involuntary se family separation, single sex shelters, and ADA compliance. Continuing on, fair, under fair housing, no person shall be discriminated against and, and, and programs slash activities shall be administered in a manner to affirmatively further fair housing, equal access to housing, is services must be open to all eligible individuals and families regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. And then going into the prohibition against involuntary family separation, the age of the children under 18 must not be used as a basis for denying a family's admission into an emergency shelter if the shelter provides services to families with children under the age of 18. Single-sex shelters, only allowable under certain condition, conditions such as serving individuals, uh, only projects serving ind individuals may be a single-sex shelter. Single sex shelter. Yeah. Sorry. Single structure with a standard bedroom or bathing facilities, shelters must not be considered a dwelling unit or it must have a shared bathing facility. And then ADA compliance. Shelters that receive funds must meet accessibility standards under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And then other information needing, needing to know around the risk analysis. So all grantees will be assessed the risk level upon review of the application. And if awarded, will be monitored during the course of their contract. Grantees assessed as high risk will receive technical assistance during the first year of the award and will receive an on-site monitoring. Grantees assessed as moderate risk will receive technical assistance and may receive either an on-site or a desk audit, and their low-risk grantees may receive only a desk audit. At this time, we'll take questions. If an entitlement is part of the state's HMIS but has lost its HMIS funding through its COC, can it apply for HMIS through this application? Again, uh, if you're an entitlement, or a non-balanced estate entity applying. You're only allowed to apply for rapid rehousing and admin funds. Okay. Can you please review the funding priorities for direct entitlement communities and the percent allocated for emergency shelter? So. Oh. Yeah, so, so the funding priorities for direct entitlement communities is the rapid rehousing. Um, no, that's not, that's not it. All right, so let me let me just talk through it. So the, uh, the direct entitlement communities are allowed to, to apply for rapid rehousing only and admin. Um, DCD plans to provide 20% of the total award allocation that we have minus our admin and our HMIS. 20% of those, that balance of those funds will be assigned to provide uh, funding to entitlement communities as well as the non-balanced state communities. Uh, can you go back to the Second part of your question. Okay, and the percent the percent of funding for emergency shelter is twenty percent of our total allocated amount will be no more than twenty percent will be assigned 
to emergency shelter activities. So that really doesn't, I don't know if that question is, uh, is, is you know, related to the previous question, but the direct entitlements don't apply for shelter, but the 20% that we allocate for shelter may be applied and allocated to uh, the balance of state communities. What about shelter serving women and children? This is not permitted under equal access rules, correct? What's not permitted? I'm not sure what she's asking. Can you further um, explain your question? What's the next question? Where will the slide presentation be available again? We plan to put the slide presentation on the CLC's uh, website on the ESG page. Uh, we'll put it on our DCD page in our library. It'll go on the um, Workplace by Facebook in the ESG work group. Is there anywhere else we can put it? <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it'll it'll be in in, in in those three locations. So the CLC website, workplace by Facebook, and on DCB's uh, federal library page. Mm -hmm. So, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to go through these slides relatively quickly. Um, these, this next section is primarily uh, programmatic stuff, um, and, and you know those of you who are veterans who uh, may have applied or received funding in the past uh, may not necessarily need to stay, but you're welcome to stay uh, if you want. We'll go. Stacy's going to go through these uh, pretty quickly and take any questions, and and then we'll be finished. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, the next slide talks about the homeless um, definition. Um, so it says it's clearly just what, what's required to define a person as homeless. They must fit in one of these two categories below, which is one in four, literally homeless individual families or individuals or families fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence with no subsequent residence, resource, or support networks and is literally homeless. For at risk of homeless, homelessness, to define a person um, as at risk of homelessness, they must fit in one of the three categories below. Um, one is has an annual income below of medium, medium family income, does not have sufficient resource or support network, and meets one of the following conditions. Um, I'm not going to read all the conditions. Um, it's, it's all listed here. If you have questions with that, um, you can contact me. Um, so just going through on page 44 is the list of the following conditions for number one. And then going on page 45, number two, a child or youth who does not qualify as homeless under section 387.3 of a runaway and, and homeless youth action um, found in 42 U.S.C. 5732A. I'm not going to read all of those. Number three, again, a child or youth who does not qualify as homeless under, under the section of McKinney Vinto Homeless Act, Assistance Act, and that's listed there, and the parents or guardians of that child or youth living with him or her. Um, next slide um, talks about, um, I think Madge might have mentioned this earlier, eligible activities for ESG is rapid rehousing, street outreach, homelessness prevention, emergency shelter, homelessness management, information system, HMIS, or admin administration. Documentation of homeless, um, homelessness, um, with, with, yeah, you could just refer to the, uh, the webinar in the DCD Federal Resource Library. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's a written um, documentation that is collected at intake. Um, it must verify the homeless status. And, and we can provide the link uh, also if anyone needs a link to the Federal Resource Library to make sure you have access to that, to that uh, webinar. And then the next slide is just the actual form that should be filled out um, which each during intake for each of uh, uh, when you're doing intake on the client. Um, next is so the next the next uh, three to the next three slides deal with written standards. 
So take some time and, and review those. Um, some COCs already have their written standards completed and others are still under development. If you're in a COC that does not have written standards, you want to follow these policies uh, and, and provide your own. And if you do have uh, a COC that has the written standards completed, then your written standards would you would need to use theirs. Thanks, Dr. Um, performance measures and goals, when you're submitting your application, um, applicants, you must write targets for each goal. Um, that includes an estimate of households it intends to serve in each of the categories below, street outreach, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, and homelessness prevention. Um, and on the next page is the target numbers that you must put in for each of those goals. Um, and on the following page, performance continues, we'd like to see your goals, your performance outcomes for your previous um, ESG if you, if you had applied um, and received funding in the previous years. Um, please um, submit those uh, outcomes. If not, just put NA in that section there. The next slide is the COC review checklist. This um, checklist will be sent to all the COC RABs for all who applied in the region. In, um, RAB region um, who is, uh, we, and we also use this uh, for the scoring criteria based on um, your participation in the CSC RAB. Um, this, the next slide is the, the project budget. This is for your, um, your overall budget. Um, you can submit individuals for your sub-recipients um, to show the breakdown of your, of your overall budget, but this project budget where it has all components um, must be uh, communicated for all of the sub-recipients that if you're applying for, with the additional sub-recipients. And the next four slides are the program uh, designs for rapid rehousing, um, street outreach, um, homelessness, homeless prevention and um, emergency shelter. If you're applying for any of these uh, components, you must um, answer these questions for every um, uh, sub-recipient that's applying. Are there any questions? I know we went through this quickly, but we're over time. Um, so are there any questions? No questions at this point, so we're going to move on. Okay. So just again, to go over the reminders quickly, Madger mentioned earlier, um, emergency shelter operations funding request should not exceed 18 months and no greater than 25% of the total operating budget for the same period. Grantees are required to participate in local COC and use the local coordinated entry process. 40% or greater of the funds will be used for rapid rehousing. 20% for emergency shelter, and written standards must be submitted with the application. Um, reminders continue, prioritize activities to support the goals in home together. Agencies are expected to use housing first model to provide service services. The statement of need must be data informed explanation of homelessness in the community. Soliciting participants explanation, explanation of how the community is notified of available services. And our target activities, again, are street outreach and housing locator services. Um, all agencies funded with ESG must participate in the point in time count each year. Applicants who previously returned funds will receive an automatic 25 point reduction in the scoring of the application. And then below is the scoring criteria will be the same. We'll continue to use a 205 point maximum scale with scoring points allocated as follows zero for incomplete or no response, three for an acceptable response, and five for an ex um, excellent response. Reminders continue. Um, reporting requirements, you are re expected to highlight and include success stories at the mid-year mark of the contract, which is the nine months into the contract, and then at the closeout of the contract, 18 months. Closeout reports should be submitted with the final invoice, but no later than 30 days after the end of the contract. Um, ineligible for funding is operation um, of coordinated entry. And questions again? No questions. Um, our last two pages, are the questions, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Our last two pages are just the resources. 
of the of best practices and uh, references for you guys to, to go to for, um, and actually the websites are on here as well for the uh, COC, for DCEB, um, the Home Together, all of that is on these pages here as well. So before we post the PowerPoint, what we'll do is update that link uh, for the single application and just use the shorter version uh, that was provided by the customer service. Uh, we'll put that in the PowerPoint. We won't be able to change it on the, um, on, on this presentation, but before the PowerPoint goes up, we'll, we'll make sure we update it with the shorter link. Uh, are there any uh, further questions before we end today? The 25 point deduction for unused funds, is that for this grant period or any grant period? Yeah, yeah as we go back the last three years. So for what you see for this contract, you'd be applying for 2019, we'll go back to 2016. So again, thank you everybody for participating. We'll get this posted as soon as possible. Uh, if you have any uh, questions related to um, the program, uh, please contact Stacy Hawthorne. Uh, any questions um, related to the uh, electronic single application, contact our customer service. Sarah, uh, Sarah is in our customer service. Um, if you have any other questions that we can answer, um, without actually helping you write the application, by all means contact us and uh, we'll, and Tiffany, uh, we will uh, get back to you um, with your, uh, with the uh, answer to your question. So thank you everyone and good luck.